we are here with Pam Temple, who I think is one of the like most wonderful real estate agents on the planet and somebody that I look up to and respect with great admiration. Uh, Pam is a top agent in the Lake Norman, North Carolina market. She consistently closes 125 transactions a year. Her business is over $50 million a year. Previously, Pam was the director of the Keller Williams luxury brand for Keller Williams International and has built a strong business that is luxury based in the Lake Norman market. And so, Pam, I want to welcome you to this podcast. It's so much fun to be talking to a good friend, and it's so great to see you, and I can't wait to learn from you in this conversation. So thanks for being here. I'm above um, thrilled and honored, so I'm delighted to be here, Mark. Uh, well, I, I'm delighted you're here. So I think maybe the best place to start this conversation is to start about with a kind of a description about how you launched your real estate career, when you got into real estate, um, how you approached getting into real estate, what your first year was like, and um, kind of walk us through um, that the whole like, or the beginning evolution of your real estate career. Okay, well, this is a, it's a pretty good story. Um, I, uh, I was, I owned, I was, I have a fashion merchandising degree. So I went to Balder Fashion College in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, then I went to UNCC and I started, um, with a clothing boutique. So if you're familiar with retail at all, um, there's no profit. <laughs> okay. Or very little profit. Um, my husband and I had been married a few years and we had spending money and, you know, this and that. Um, but we also had two young little boys, um, Katie and Hunter were three and four at the time. And, um, I had done what every good buyer does. And that is buy a house, build a house on a hill. Okay. So now I know better, <laughs> right. hard to resell and hard to keep the kids from falling down the, the hill, um, as they're learning to ride their bikes. So we had a huge, massive backyard and, um, I asked my husband, Kent, who I certainly adore, um, uh, honey, I need a patio. I need a huge patio so the boys don't kill themselves and um, so they can ride their skateboards and their bikes and just play on. So I don't have to worry about them as a mama. And Kent said, no. Really? We, we can't afford it. Oh, okay. So first of all, I, um, that's certainly not one of my favorite words, um, yet it's a very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it always challenges me. Yeah. So um, being a boutique store owner um, with little or no profit, um, mostly just fun money, um, we, we didn't have $3,000, which is what it was going to cost me to build a patio for my boys. And so I started thinking, my dad had rental property growing up and he had his realtor for life. And I know your mom's a realtor, was a realtor as well, Mark. So, you know, that's the ultimate goal is have a realtor for life. So I thought, you know what? I think maybe I'll go get my real estate license. So I call up Nadine, who was my dad's realtor. And I said, Nadine, you know, um, I think I'm going to go get my real estate license and um, I'm just going to do it part time. I just need a few things. That was it. I just need a few things. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, Pamela, I've known you your whole life. You've never done anything part time. <laughs> um, but I think you should go, go get, go get your real estate license. So I told Kent what I was going to do. And, um, and of course, as he does with anything that I want or desire, he's all in. Okay. He wasn't all in enough to give me the money first, <laughs> but he did say, go out and earn it. Um, so I, there was an extended or a condensed class two and a half weeks. I went and got my real estate license, um, uh, passed it. Um, as I'm getting my license, which is a great um, tip for everybody. I was telling everybody I knew what I was doing. OK, so I started building my database, everything that I've ever been. My dad was in retail grocery stores and it was all about the relationships that we had with people and and um, um, and letting people that we that trust us, that we trust, know what we're doing because they will want to help you. Right. So that's what we did. We um, I told everybody what I was going to do. Um, Keller Williams Realty was not in our area at the time. There was a huge um 
uh, independent company called Allen Tate Realtors that was there. And um, so I jumped with, um, with the biggest and the best at that time. And that's where I started. So I got my first sale from a friend. It was my friend's uncle who bought a, um, who bought a house, uh, not a house, I'm sorry, a lot on the water over $500,000. And I started my real estate career in 1998. So a $500,000 lot, I mean, today it's still nice. Back in the day, it was, you know, excellent. Um, So closed my first sale the first 30 days I was in the business. Wow. And so- you prepared. You done the pre-work, right? I did. I was all in. All in. So um, two weeks after that, I, I built my boys a patio and I've been like, OK, this is this is a great industry. This is a great career. And um, that's where it started. Uh, what a great story. Mm-hmm. How did you do your first year in real estate? I did pretty good. I was rookie of the year um, wow. in 1999 um, at Allen Tate. I was rookie of the year. I, um, I did uh, uh, all the basics, um, a lot of the basics that we still do now. I did every open house I could do. I did every phone duty I could do. All I did was build relationships and build my database wow. and, um, and just talk to people and, you know, got emotionally connected with people. And, um, and that t- today still is um, one of my number one lead generators. So let's talk about your business today, now 22 years later. Okay. Well, for the first probably five or six years, um, I used no tools, <laughs> no systems, no models, except for just um, as you flying by the seat of my pants, like a lot of entrepreneurs probably do themselves just naturally. Um, so, uh, it, and, you know, after I joined Keller Williams in 2002, um, Wendy Harrelson recruited me and um, she gave me that red book that we, that we know about. It's the models and the systems to create a big business in real estate. And um, I put it up on the shelf and I'm like, you know, I'm busy. I don't have time for this. I don't have time to implement systems and models or whatever. So all I did was work work, work, work. Um, so n- going forward, um, you know, 22 years down the business and um, I have four admin that um, help our team. Kent and I still sell a little bit, um, mostly just our friends and our family. We have four um, sales agents and, um, and, you know, just consistently do a really nice business for us. That's terrific. And just for our listeners that don't know what that red book is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's at the top of my favorite books and that's the millionaire real estate agent right. by Gary Keller. Mm-hmm. And, um, what's so great about that book is that Gary went and studied the most successful role models who had built more than a sales job that was making them a lot of money. They had built businesses that followed business models. And then he documented the models and showed how they work. So right. for any agent, at any level, whether they're starting in the business or whether they are seasoned agents, that book is a must read. It is an absolute must read. There's the four simple models in the MREA. I mean, you've got to have your plan. You've got to know your goals. And up until I started studying the book, I, I didn't have any true career goals in terms of, I want to do this much volume, this many units, help this many buyers, help this many sellers. I never thought like that. I just helped everybody that I could that came my way. Right. So it made me think like a business owner. And that's probably the, the greatest advice that I could give anybody wanted to get into real estate is, yes, you are you are a realtor. You, you do have that designation, that license, but you're a business owner. And so if you initially go into it thinking like a business owner, um, you'll skyrocket. Right. Your trajectory will be much faster than most of us who who didn't think that way in the beginning. Yeah. It's not a sales job. Mm mm. It's yeah. a real estate business that business. you're the CEO of, right? right? Yes. And, and yeah. that's, a, that's a different set of skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, businesses follow models that are proven. Right. And uh, the millionaire real estate agent kind of laid out that model. So yeah. I, yeah. I, it's I a mindset. It's a mindset change for sure. Okay. So um, let's, let's just, let's back up for a second. Hearn 25 transactions. Mm-hmm. What, like what percentage of those are buyers? What percentage of sellers? Is it 50-50? It's, a, a, right now it's about 50-50. Um, we've always focused on listings. And as you know, the buyers come as a result from that. Yeah. Um, so we, we have always been listing 
focused. Yeah, you know, I, I always said buyers are a byproduct mm -hmm. of your listings. Right, right. And so right. the game is not to go find a buyer who wants to buy today. The game is to go find a great listing and not stop until you get there, right? And leverage the heck out of it so you so you gain more listings and buyers from it. Absolutely. In, in the MRA book, in the Million Real Estate book, it says listings are the gift from the real estate gods. And that's the way we need to think of it. I mean, it, we are, everyone should be listing based, especially if they're the business owner, the CEO of their business. Right, right. So um, when, how, let's talk about becoming a listing. I use the word powerhouse because you are a, a, a listing powerhouse in your marketplace. Um, let's talk about uh, how that's different from a buyer focused practice um, and what the nuances are of, you know, your, your daily routine, your daily focus and how you, how you lead that effectively? Um, I would say what we always focus on, first of all, on the, in the team and, and the way we drive our value is three things. We talk about emotionally connecting with people. We talk about giving the, the data to them. So giving them the information that they want to know. And we talk about service. And so those are our three core, core pillars of, of, our, of, of the Temple team. And, um, but we do that through focusing on listings, um, emotionally connecting with them and telling them the value that their property can, can get, you know, talking about, you know, we, as you know, and everybody on our team, their full, their, their sole focus to their entire database is to be the economist of choice. Okay. So we know our market, um, I, I, and not the entire, the Charlotte Lake Norman market, it's very broad. So, um, you know, there's, there's seven counties that co go around, um, Lake Norman, Lake Norman is 520 miles of shoreline. So, um, it's a large place. Um, I've lived here my entire life, so I know it. Um, and I know all the nuances and, and just all the phenomenal things about our, about our place, about our home. Um, but we have agents that, that specialize in specific areas of their market. Um, you can't know everything about all things, but you can know most of everything about something, right? And so, you know, we have people that focus all around the market and they focus on listings and their number one, um, when, when they go to bed at night, they need to know that they've, they've achieved their goals. And there's only two of them. And it's to, um, it's to emotionally connect with people, build trust that builds loyalty um, and to know their market better than they did the day before. Yeah, I, let's on emotionally connecting with people and building trust and rapport. Mm -hmm. um, what like what are your unique strategies about that? Um, do do you as a team do you do you all have a checklist for emotionally connecting? Or is it more intuitive um, and definitely more intuitive? I'm, I mean, we have checklists. I mean, we've got closing checklists, listing checklists, buyer checklists, all those checklists and things like that, which is a component of a successful business. But we're very intuitive and knowing, um, you know, very um, uh, proactive. Um, super, super proactive. We always um, say if somebody asks us a question that we didn't do our job. Um, and when you can emotionally connect with, with people, you kind of know what they want and what they need or what they desire before they do, right? Mm -hmm. You, you kind of know what, what most likely they're going to ask you. And somebody, some people, I know that you've got a skill that's amazing, Mark, and how you remember everybody's names and makes them feel so special all the time just because you say their name to them. I mean, that's, that's a gift. Um, I've been working on that my entire life and it still doesn't come easy to me but it's things like that you know it's being it's being servant minded um which helps you emotionally connect with people yeah serving other people I, i'll say this that you know you, you and i offline have had a conversation about how much you love people mm -hmm. and i'm the same way i love people and so I, I think that on a certain level, I'm not saying you have to love people to emotionally connect. And yet I think you have to see the best in people and you have to understand what they want 
you have to serve their needs and you have to show up faithfully so that over time that trust and rapport and that emotional connection is is evident and you you do that so well naturally um that's why i asked do you guys have a checklist for the emotional connection checklist <laughs> no no um you know and I, I talk a lot to our team uh you know about people and about understanding behaviors and and just natural tendencies and 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 first of all we always start it by saying most everybody is good right most everybody on this planet they're good people um, and they're just different, like ever, they have different personalities. So you just have to figure out, you know, what their, what their, um, love language is just by a few questions that you can ask them about their family, occupation, recreations, and dreams. We talk about forwarding them as a common acronym in our, in our, actually in any service industry. Um, but just, just understanding people will get you so far and appreciating them for who they are and not try to change them and adapt to them because this is, we, we got into this industry, to this career to serve people to help people. So it's not up to us to change. It's us, up to us to adapt to service more people. Yeah, I, I love that because, you know, when you talk about connecting with people and doing it with heart, I think that that, that gives such great context because if, if I'm thinking on behalf of the typical salesperson, they're thinking, I don't want to waste their time. Mm -hmm. I don't want to not have something intelligent that I can say. And they miss that important first step, which is a quality dialogue that is about the other person, what's important to them, what their needs are. And, and, and 100 percent, that's that's the only way that you can go into an effective listing relationship is, is through a really good needs analysis and, and understanding the person. The needs analysis is the most important thing that you can do. And some people will look at, at that as a checklist. Okay. And I think it's important that you not forget a question that's in, that, that you need to ask because it's all about the questions that we ask yet. It's, it's not like a bop, 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 down, you know, down the list for us. It's um, it's a conversation that we have with people. Um, it all starts with knowing, liking and trusting and, um, you know, even though we do have like lead, lead, um, lead buyer sheets, lead seller sheets so that we don't forget something, it's, it's more of, um, you know, this is really important to me. I don't want to forget something that may be important to you. So is it OK if I take notes? Is it OK if I use this checklist so that I don't forget to ask you something? Because we're probably going to have some good conversations and we may go off topic a little bit. And this will just help me bring it back in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, one thing that might be really helpful for our listeners is if you would share your listing checklist and your buyer checklist and the Absolutely. tools that you use um, to, to kind of manage the process. Yeah, I'd love to. And, and we'll offer that as kind of an attachment or a footnote to this conversation, because I think it's, you know, wherever you are in your career, you appreciate seeing what other people are using that's working. Right. And, and I have to be honest, there's nothing that we have in 22 years or the last 18 years that we were focused on models and systems that I, we didn't get from someone else. So I would love to give it um, to anybody that that would like it. And another thing, speaking of checklists, is that, you know, we it's especially when we talk about luxury and uh, the affluent, um, maybe a little bit later, um, there is a service recovery time that happens a lot like where we mess up right have you ever messed up <laughs> oh first we, job. yeah we mess up a lot um and and yet we we always apologize and we always go back to say you know where was the hole what what did we miss so all of these checklists are are live um are live documents that we update all the time and um um, but don't be afraid of failures and, and mishaps and stuff, because most of the time, and we get this from the Ritz Carlton, when we recover from a failure, we're better off. We have more loyalty built with that client than if that never happened before. So it's super important to know that sometimes the failures that we have in the transaction um, 
it, it, it builds, first of all, the knowledge that we have through the transaction for future transactions, but it also builds trust and loyalty with the client that they know that we've made it right and we've owned it. And, um, and that and they're usually more loyal to us than they were to begin with. Yeah. What I love about that is that you don't come from a defensive position. No, you come from a curious position and a commitment to make it right. right. I think anybody who's hearing this, uh, we all, you know, when, when we get questioned, I think a knee jerk response we have is to get defensive mm -hmm. right. and, um, you, you, you got to short circuit that you got to, you got to get beyond that in order to make okay. things right. So that's, that's, that's it's all, it's okay. always our fault. If something happens, wh whether it's for our fault or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's healthy. You know, you <laughs> jerk keeps you humble and on yeah. track. And, and I think humility is something that people respond to and being vulnerable about mistakes and, and allowing yeah. But having said that, you can't make the same mistake over and over and over again, right? I mean, right. Yeah. yeah, don't don't be ignorant of it. That's right. That's right. Okay, so in building a listing business, what I hear is that there there are nuances that are different. I know that uh, I've seen your pre-listing packet, and it's gorgeous and phenomenal. Uh, how much pre-work do you put into a listing presentation? Um, not a lot, um, because it's a system that we have in place. So, um, Bravo. You know, huh? Bravo. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and for a lot of the, um, neighborhoods that we do, we're huge farmers, if you will. So we geographically farm a lot. Um, and we also, um, demographically farm, um, for, for our sphere of influences and, and whatnot. So, and as I said before, we're a student of our market every day. What do we know today that we didn't know yesterday? So it's not like, um, you get this listing appointment and then I've got to go prepare and learn everything that's happened in the last five years because our job is to keep up with the market every single day. So the really the only prep work we have to do is first of all, learn about our client, right? We, you know, we do some Google searches um, almost naturally because we study our market all the time. All right, Pam, we had a little moment where we froze up. And what you said is, first of all, learn about our client before you go on the listing presentation, Google searches. And then beyond that, what'd you say? Um, Google searches, um, you know, we can find a lot on, it's called OWL, it's online wealth lookup. We learn about, you know, what their charities that they, that they um, enjoy participating in, um, you know, just a lot of personal things about them. You can learn, not that you are going to talk about them, but you have basic knowledge of who you're meeting with. Um, so we, we learn as much as we can about the person themselves. Um, we do a needs analysis with them on the phone as well. So we have a basis of, you know, what, what, their, what their basic needs are from the consultation that we go on. Um, mm -hmm. But pretty much it's, we, we build it over time. So it's not a lot of pre-work. Mm -hmm. Okay. All of our marketing pieces are, are completed and ready. They're in folders. Everything now, even though we take it physically with us on the listing consultations, we deliver it via email beforehand with the e with the um appointment reminder you know shows you all of our video tours our our 3d tours all of our marketing pieces that they can expect when they hire us so all of that's done we, we it's called a pre-listing packet and we do it um, virtually um and the the purpose behind that is you've told them you were going to do something already right you're going to set the appointment you're going to send them a pre-listing package and the beauty of that is that you do it so yeah. you're already saying, you know what? I told you I was going to do something and I did it. I love that. Yeah. So everybody asked me what, huh? You've already kept your word. Right. Right. And you set kind of a pattern for the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The when we talk about um, customer experience um, with, with our team, um, we, the, the basis of it is tell people what you're going to do, do it. Mm hmm Tell people that you did it and tell them what comes next. Uh, like, I, I mean, if you can so communicate. Simple. So simple. So simple. And yet, I think when we get in a rush, we, we can avoid kind of going through a model like that. Because and we know what we're going to do, right? Yeah. Because it's what we do all the time. Right. But right. they only do it a couple of times in their whole life. 
most of the time. Yeah, that's so great. Okay, so what's in that pre-listing packet? Um, marketing forms. I mean, I've got plenty of them here. We've got um, uh, brochures. You know, we show how beautiful we present their house because it's all about pricing and present uh, the presentation of the property and how you position it in the market. Um, all of our, uh, our print um, uh, listing consultations. Can you hold um, that up and point it at sure. the camera because everybody can see it? Okay, that, that shows the typical team up at the top. Right. And it just, what does it say? Superior marketing on the cover? Superior marketing for, for every home. For right. every home. So so we have a, a, a slogan is um, white glove service for every price point. Um, back when I was solely focusing on luxury, um, I missed out on a lot of traditional business. So I um, I am all inclusive. <laughs> So I love helping luxury buyers and sellers with their property um, and gaining the lifestyle that they that they choose. But I also love working with first time home buyers and um, first time home sellers and the way they move up. The best way to gain into the luxury market is to move up with your clients. Um, you know, it's, it's an easy transition. Right, right. So, so yeah, so just a thank you note is in there to them. Um, you know, sometimes we have gifts that we that we deliver with them, depending on what type of swag we have in stock. Um, always something to leave behind, just so that that they're thinking of us. But the the most important thing is the quality of your materials. It can't just be halfway printed. It can't just be. Um, second thought, like, oh, maybe I should just go quickly, you know, Xerox, that's showing my age, print this or whatever. And so that they have an example. I mean, we, we, we print um, and deliver quality, quality materials for every price point. Yeah. And it shows, I've seen your pre-listing packet and it's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. it, it truly is. Okay. So um, let's share, a, we'll get a, if you'll get that to us, Sure. You can share it with the listeners so that everybody can see it. Yep. Let's talk about uh, your your <clears throat> toolbox. Uh, you, you, when you think about your toolbox of unique resources that you count on uh, and systems that you use, um, and it, let's start like with um, database management. Um, do you, you use the CRM? Obviously, right? Absolutely. Once I figured out what what it was. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So we use, use we use command now, which is through Keller Williams Realty. Yeah. Um, it saves us a lot of money. Um, and you you've said this um, yourself, Mark. It's like there's never there's no perfect CRM. The only perfect one is the one that you use, right? That's, and so we, we meant we went many years not using the CRM for its purpose, which is to stay in contact with the people that you know, your database. Um, uh, and once you get purposeful and intentional about using it and touching the people that you know or that you want to know better, um, it's it's a game changer for your business. So we use Command now, um, and uh, we used to use Boomtown, which was very expensive. Um, and so um, again, you kind of get out of it what you put into it. Um, so that's probably the lesson that most people need to know is they don't need to go spend a ton of money on a CRM. Um, they just need to use the ones available to them. How, how, how much time do you spend per day on lead generation? Um, all, all day I spend on lead generation. Okay. Like what, tell me what you do. So, um, you know, I, I think when I was beginning, so, you know, so I have, I have the saying, so it's, it's my three P's, you know, my name is Pam and you know, it's always, P this, P that, or whatever. And my mom taught me from the very beginning um, the five P's. Most people probably know of them. It's proper preparation prevents poor performance. So right. really just caring about what you're doing. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do it, be there and you know, um, be be purposeful in it and present in it. Um, but I have another three P's, and it's all about purpose, profit, and peace. Okay, so if, if the things that I do and, and I get to I get to lead generate through all of these. So whatever my purpose is, um, whether it's my charities or whether it's my family or my community or whatever it is, I, you know, I'm so proud to be a realtor. I'm so proud to be a realtor and I'm not afraid to talk about it because I know I can help people. 
So my purpose is to help people every single day. So, so me helping people is the way I can lead generate for my team. You know, they know how much I care about them. They know that if I, that, that I care about my business and I wouldn't have great people working for me um, that, you know, that, I mean, you know, that's my lead generation with whatever I do, whether I'm on the tennis court, if I'm on the tennis court, I've got my temple team swag on, I've got my caps on, you know, I've got tons of business just out of my, you know, the, the, the country club, you know, that I belong to and, and doing the physical activities that I love. So just don't think that it's just calling, right? Cold call. Sometimes that's people's business. That's not my business. Have I done it before? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I enjoy it? No. <laughs> Um, love it, your honesty and it's it, real. I mean, I, I get that. Yeah. It, yeah. So, um, and yet if was, was there a time where to get the desire out of my business that I had to do some things that I didn't like to do? Yeah. I, and I, and I did them right. Um, my son, but my, my oldest two sons are both in real estate now. And, you know, they have to call for sub owners. They have to call expireds. They have to do these things because they're building their business. And, um, and, and because they're so passionate about what, the, what they're doing, it's, it's, um, it's not really a job to them because of what comes out of it. So, you know, there's different stages of our journey to um, in our careers. And, you know, I'm just now at the time where I don't have to do that. I can really lead generate through my person, through my purpose and um, and through, um, you know, through the through the peace that that I get from serving people. Uh, I love that. OK. Other must haves in your toolbox. People. I people. mean, people. It's uh, at my greatest tool are the people that I surround myself with and it's their job to create all these checklists. You know, we, we use command. We, um, Oh my gosh, Mark, I don't even know what we used to be honest, but, um, I, I really don't, but, but they're phenomenal and they know how to bulletproof a transaction and they, you know, their greatest asset are, are the, are the, um, the checklist that they've developed the information they've received from other teams or other real estate agents that are business owners that are doing it at a high, high level, but they're, uh, um, they also use the, the knowledge that they get from the attorneys and the inspectors and, you know, and, but again, all that's based on relationships and, you know, you can get, I can give you every checklist I have, every checklist I have, but it's going to be based on whether you're going to follow them and you're going to have people that will allow you to help them that like trust and, um, and believe in your service. Yeah. I, I, I love that. And it's so real. I mean, you can have the best checklist in the world. You can get a checklist anywhere. You, you can, can be the most knowledgeable agent in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You can have the best knowledge of the, the technical aspects of the business, the contracts and all of that mm -hmm. and be broke is all get out in this industry because it's about the people. And it's about how comfortable you are delivering your, your value proposition over and over and over again. So that it becomes like second nature, right? Right. And it's, and the more you do it, the more confident that you become, and then the more competent you become, right? So it's, it all comes from practice every right. single day practice, 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 learn your market a little bit. You can't, you know, you can't go from, you know, zero to a hundred in a day, but you can know a little bit more today than you did yesterday. That, that whole 1% advantage. Yeah. I, I, uh, I remember that at a certain point in my career, and I think it was like 28, 29 years old, I went to a title company in Austin, invited me to go to Jim Rohn, the, the, you know, America's foremost business philosopher, and he's, he's he passed away, I think, about eight, seven, eight years ago. And he's yeah. such, a, such a hero of mine and such a role model. And he said two things that have stuck with me my entire career. And he said a lot that stuck with me. But these two things were in every day. And then shut your door, turn off your phone and work another 30 minutes. Mm. Yeah. And do that with preparation for a fun trip you're going to take once a quarter 
Oh, yeah. When you, when, when you, you know, have just finished the trip, you have one to look forward to in another 10, 12 weeks. And if you're at the week moving up towards that trip, your 30 minutes every day might become extra 30 minutes a day might become 45 minutes a day. And so I, I love that you just, you just keep pushing. You just keep, keep going. You know, Pam, I'm going to tell kind of a fun story. And that is that you and Kent were at a Carolina Panthers game one time. And uh, I had something going on in my life where I needed some encouragement and you, I guess at the Panthers games, they have this big drum, like a great big drum, right? And you went up to it with that big boomstick and you said, keep on pounding, keep pounding. And it was such a great message. I know that part of what makes you so special is your ability to connect with and encourage people and lift people up. And I just, I just kind of want to do a shout out to you and share with you how much that meant to me at the time. And and how much I, I know that what you do means to other people. It's, oh, so it's sweet. really special. Okay, so let's let's talk about what a day in your life looks like. Well. What time do you wake up? What time do you wake up? <laughs> Eight o'clock? No, 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 no. Um, I try to wake up around 6 to 6.30. But I'm, e- I'm easily awakened at 7 a.m. Like okay. I'm, I'm out of bed at 7. That's easy. Oh, yeah. That's easy. Okay. okay. And then so, and what does your morning routine look like? My morning routine is I'm very spoiled. So at 7.01, if not earlier, my husband brings me a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, I'm, I'm sitting around like, like where's, where's my coffee? <laughs> like, what's going on? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, um, I do my daily devotions um, every morning. Um, whether it's, um, you know, an email devotion that I get. Um, I'm a huge student. You're talking about mentors. You know, I've certainly never met formerly. Um, uh, uh, oh my gosh. Um, John Maxwell, but I do his daily devotion every single day about leadership. Um, so I really just take a little bit of time for me and just kind of get my mindset ready for the day and um, just get my perspective and, you know, my energy and my, you know, just like, okay, you know, how I'm going to make this a great day. And there's usually only a couple things that I have to accomplish every single day to make it great. Um, I love to play tennis and now I'm a huge pickleball fan. Like who would have ever thought that? So um, I, part of my lead generation are the leagues that I'm on and that, you know, that I get to, to, um, play work on. And um, so if I'm doing something like that, then I do get up earlier to make sure that I've got my day planned for the, for the rest of the time. It's, you know, calendar, calendaring, calendaring and, and, and time blocking is the most important thing you can do for a successful day. And, and I'm not great at it. Not great at it. My husband is phenomenal at it. Um, I'm not every single day. I try to get a little bit better at time blocking and controlling my schedule. Um, I probably say yes to more things that I should say yes to. Um, another, another yep. thing. Yeah. That I'm, that I'm working on. Um, sometimes I look at my calendar. I'm like, okay, who, whose day is this? Cause it doesn't look like my day. It looks like everybody else's day. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, you know, I guess to answer your question, I, I, I don't sleep in, if you will, but I'm not an early riser. Um, I wish so bad that I wanted to get up in the morning and go for a walk. You know, I, I, that's not, I wish, I always wanted to be a runner. I always wanted to be somebody that loved to exercise. I always wanted to be that person, but I'm just not. Um, I love to go on the lake and play. I love to play tennis and, and pickleball and activities like that. that are in a, more of a group setting. Um, uh, and when I, when I, when I'm able to do that, then I get up early and get my work done before. And then I know what's, what my two to three big rocks are the rest of the day. Um, so, you know, I, and, and just I'm not great at it. Rocks, I have to be honest. Finding what those rocks are every day, that alone is an amazing best practice, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So I know that you built a great luxury business. Let's shift gears and let's talk about the nuances of luxury and how the affluent consumer is different, how you have to run your business differently. 
um, what um, you would have, you know, let's start there and then get into helping other people see the way they might navigate building a luxury business. Well, I want to start off by saying that the luxury consumer clientele, the affluent is not that much different than, than anybody else. Okay. I think that everybody deserves the same um, um, amount of respect and acknowledgement and um, communication that a luxury client does. Okay. Um, in terms of, of marketing their properties, Mark, it's, it's, it costs more money. All right. So to get into luxury, you've got to know that it's going to cost more to market a luxury property um, than just a traditional property. Most of the time, because it's days on market, you know, mm -hmm. it's the upper echelon of, of the consumers that can afford a luxury market. So um, it, it's days on the market that you have to carry the home and continue the advertising and continue the positioning and the repositioning of their property. So it's always top of mind. Um, it, and so that's in terms of marketing, there's there's it's, there's more expense, you know, Matterport, 3D tours, video tours, drone tours of the neighborhood of the lifestyle that they can achieve by living there. Um, just getting into it's really not about the house, but it's about the the way they feel living in that house and the lifestyle that they want to portray outside of the house. So it's a lot of understanding the um, the, the the background of who the client is. Um I would say they're, they're, they're less forgiving um, if there is mistakes that happen or their time is wasted or communication isn't stellar. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty much in my experience. And I've, you know, I've worked with super, you know, affluent people um, and honest, they're some of the nicest people that I've ever met and some of my best friends today. Um, are probably my, my most luxurious clients. Um, and the biggest thing is don't waste their time, communicate, uh, uh, over communicate. If you've heard me ever, if anybody, students are out there, because I love to go out and teach and, and provide any type of experience that I can um, to other people. Um, it's, it's you can't over communicate in any price range and you're never going to get fired for over communicating. So nobody's ever said, uh, you know what? I'm not working with you, Pam. You just communicate too much. <laughs> it doesn't happen. That's, that's, I love that. That's, you're not going to get fired for over communicating. No, but how, I mean, being a leader of an office, I was a team leader for eight years, broker in charge. That's the one complaint that we all get was, you know, my, real, my realtor doesn't communicate with me. Mm -hmm. They were great up until the appointment when I gave them the opportunity. But then after that, after that happened, after we signed the listing agreement or signed the buyer agency, you know, I don't hear from them. Do you and, have systems and tools that you'd like to share that uh, are your communication tools? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. What, what, like, how does that work? It just depends on what phase they're in. Okay. So if they're an active seller, active buyer, and in this market, oh my goodness, um, you know, if, if we don't have an offer, even in the luxury market, Mark, we, okay, so my prime market's called The Point um, in the Mooresville, Lake Norman area. And I know back, it. I remember The Point. Yes, yeah. I bet you do. So, um, so back in the day where it was, it was more of, um, I guess, a buyer's market, more stable market, mm -hmm. um, we would have 60 houses on the market at any given time. We have about 900 homes in, in the point. So about 60 was, um, and I don't know the ratio on that. So somebody that can do math can do that. Um, today, we have two houses on the market, both over $5 million. Wow. Um, my son is at an open house that we're there, that we're getting ready to push the live button in just a few minutes. And, um, and he'll have people, you know, standing in line to see it and we'll have multiple offers by, you know, tonight at six o'clock and it's a, it's a $900,000 house. And I mean, so, so the communication t in today's market, um, is it's easy because there's so much going on yeah. when communication fails is that is in a market where there's not all this crazy activity 
And um, we have to look for reasons to call people and to touch, to, to, to catch up and to touch, you know, touch base with them and just check in. So though, that's when the checklists are really needed, um, uh, you know, to keep you on task so that, that, you, that you're never fired for under-communicated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is so good. And um, is there like a, a runway of um, requirements that you have before you'll put a luxury home on the market? Is there, is there like a, I, I, I know how important staging is. I know how important the photography is. I know how important all the different aspects of, you know, presenting the house mm-hmm. are. Absolutely. Um, presentation, on, presentation on day one is the most important. And in fact, most of the time we're doing everything coming soon. So that presentation of the, of the first day coming soon, we know that everybody ser- starts their search on the internet. So that's their first showing. So if you don't have the staging complete, you don't have the presentation of the property. And I'm talking about it, maybe it needs um, a pre-inspection. Maybe it needs new landscaping. Maybe it needs a new front door paint. Maybe it needs um, pressure washing. Um, it's so much more than just going in there and taking pictures. It's the presentation behind the pictures that that really matters. And so, no, we the days of come list me and your house will be on the market tomorrow are over. That, that does not happen. And it's coordination between all of the vendors that we have that work with us. Um, you know, we only work with the best. And of course, a lot of people want to work with the best vendors. So, you know, you know, can we call in favors sometime? Yes, but we don't overdo that because we respect their businesses as well. Yeah, the, uh, let me ask a question about luxury consumers. Do you find that once they find their agent, they're more loyal than oh, mainstream? Absolutely. Consumers? They at 100%. That's, that's, that's my experience is that once you've got your person, uh, you stay pretty loyal and luxury. Whereas in the mainstream, you might, like, I know, I, I know uh, for example, last year I sold a house for 10 million mm-hmm. that I owned, I sold a house for 4 million that I owned and I bought um, an expensive lake house last year. So I, I did three pretty big luxury transactions. Mm-hmm. I always go back to the same person because I know what I can count on. Mm-hmm. But I also did quite a few other transactions and I used different people. According well, to- I think you appreciate people's specialties as well. Right. So, I mean, there's something to be said for being a specialist in one area or another or with one demographic or one geographic area or another. So it's great that they've proven their value. Um, You know what you're getting in terms of their communication and the trust that 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 you put in them. Um, But what I see a lot of times is it, it takes a lot of work to build a relationship. Yes, it does. You know, and it takes a lot of trust and it takes a lot of time. And the one thing that um, uh, that luxury buyers, sellers, clients, um, they don't want their time wasted. So if you've done a good job and um, and and respecting that time, they certainly don't want to start that process over with someone else. Um, So and and then the confidentiality that um, the things that you know about them, the things that you know about their family, the things that they that you know about their job, their you know, their personal life, they certainly don't want to share that with someone else because they're most of the time, they're very private people. Um, so without a, without a doubt, yeah, it, it, you know, you always say whenever you get the phone call, where you get the appointment, you've already won and it's up to you to lose it. So, you know, it is so much easier, so much easier to keep a client than to find a new one. Yes. So, you know, we just need to do a better job at keeping the clients that we have, um, whether they're luxury clients or traditional. Yeah, that's that's so obvious. And yet so few people value the clients that they have. I, I mean, I watch agents that are really focused on active calling lead generation. Right. And it's like it's just burning churn. And it becomes something where these these agents may not value the existing people that they have as much as they should, right? 
Did we freeze up for a minute? Did I'm sorry about that. Um, no, no, it's 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 all good. Okay, so I know we we spent uh, a lot of time talking about uh, building a listing business, building a luxury business, and you've just shared so many amazing gems of information, Pam. And I'm so grateful for this, and I know our listeners are too. I want to ask if you were giving advice to somebody that's starting in the real estate industry, what would you share with them? Find their passion. You know, there's so many avenues that, that you can go down so many different, you know, clientele, so many different geographic areas, um, whether it's first time home buyers or maybe condos or, you know, or, um, you know, waterfront properties, country club properties, whatever it is, find your passion and go all in, you know, work hard, work more than you thought you were ever going to have to do. Um, it, you know, whatever your desire is, if, if you're wanting to be a $10 million producer, then act like a $20 million producer, go find out what all the producers are doing. $20 million are, are doing and do it. And then there's no doubt you won't hit that 10 million. So just give it, give it more than you think you have. You know, it's that it's that one percent difference. And as you said, Jim Rohn, work 30 minutes longer than you said you were. Show up before other people get there and stay later. You know, in the beginning, you, you gotta you gotta be all in, but you can't really be all in unless you haven't found the passion behind it or or your big why or your purpose. So figure that out first and then just go do it. Go do it. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't because you can, if you desire it. And then work your butt off. And work your butt off, work your butt off. And at some point, I I know this is true for me, uh, when you're doing what you're passionate about, it doesn't feel like work. You're not working. You're not working. You're not so, working. Not you know, I, um, they, they show that diagram. I can't remember where it is, but it's like, you know, sometimes you get totally out of balance with things. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'm out of balance and I'm playing too much, right? Or I'm spending too much time with my family, but I'm so happy. Like, I'm so glad I'm here. And then sometimes I'm working too much. I mean, in a perfect balanced life, I'm working too much, but I love what I do. I love the people that I serve. So it's not like working. So, you know, just... Just you've got to have that that attitude behind, um, you know, your your purpose. Yeah, that's this has been so terrific. You've shared so much amazing information. And again, I just want to say how grateful I am for your friendship, for your sharing um, all of your like trade secrets, so to speak, and everything that you've learned. And I know this is going to help a lot of agents shorten their learning curve. And for that. Pam, you are, you are the best and you're a one in a million and I'm so grateful for you. Is there anything that you want to share just as a final note or anything that, that, that kind of crosses your mind as something that maybe I should have asked and didn't ask or. Oh gosh. Um, you know, I think you covered a lot of it. I think we could have went deeper into every um, little thing that we, we shared together, but I just want to thank you. Um, any opportunity that I get to spend with you is, is a gift. So I appreciate your time and, and everything that you do for our industry and that you do for the people that you love. And um, it definitely, it, it's definitely appreciated. And well, um, I, I want to see you in person soon. So we'll oh, I hope that. so. <laughs> I'd love to do that and tell Ken hello. I know I met KT when we had dinner at my house. Yes. Oh my God. He, he knows everything you do. Um, so it's fun to watch him watch you. And now Hunter Dean is like six months in the business. And so um, it's fun to watch everybody. It's fun to watch everybody grow. And, you know, for all these kids that, you know, used to hide my phone, <laughs> Used to, I used to sneak in the closet and make my phone calls and call back my clients. And they're like, I'm never getting into real estate. This, you, you, like, this is horrible. You work all the time. Now they know how much I love it. And, um, and those kids that said they would never get into real estate are. So. Yeah. That's terrific. I love that. What, what a great legacy that uh, you leave. Uh, just not for your, just your family, but this whole industry as a whole. And um, you're special. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for everything. Okay. Bye. Bye.